It's no secret that I wasn't the biggest fan of Black Ops 4 Zombies. I thought Classified was pretty great, if you ignore the ending. 9 was... alright. But Voyage of Despair and Blood of the Dead really weren't my cup of tea, to put it lightly. Then there's all those nasty leaks that came out, and the predatory monetization practices, and of course, the fact that the game barely even functioned at launch. So naturally, I decided to step away from the game, and genuinely had no plans to ever revisit it. But then the Dead of the Night Director's Cut trailer came out and I said, huh, that looks pretty cool. All right, what's the harm in trying it out? Worst thing that happens is I don't like the map and lose an hour or two of my time. Right? Well, without showing my hand too much, that didn't really happen. So, here we are. But before we delve into Dead of the Night, let's recap what's changed since the release of Black Ops 4 back in October. Hopefully this will help us all get a bit more up to speed. First, and most importantly, there's been numerous stability updates, crash fixes, and glitches patched. Now, it is a lot more stable than it was on launch, which is great, but the game still has troubles with main quest runs and co-op games on PS4. A new objective-based mode called Gauntlets was added. Think the tortured path, but every round is an objective slash challenge round. Whatever your reaction to that sentence was is likely how you'll feel about the entire mode. A new perk was added called Ethereal Razor. The perk increases melee damage, exponentially so when it's in your modifier slot, and can hit multiple enemies at once with an offhand swipe. For clarification, an offhand attack is what happens when you melee while holding a normal weapon. So this does not affect the bayonet on the vapor, or the stiletto knife on the strife. Daily challenges referred to as callings were added, and completing them can reward you with bonus XP, a contraband tier skip, and microtransactions. While their addition is appreciated, they are a massive step down from World War II's orders and contract system. In that game, you were given six new orders and nine contracts daily, in addition to three weekly orders. The Hellhound spawn rate was decreased on Blood of the Dead, which does make this map a bit better to play. Although this did have an unintended consequence, it made grinding out those vermin kills for the Thompson take so much longer. On the topic of Hellhounds, the collision boxes still are not fixed. For reference, when a Hellhound spawns in, its collision box is not synced up with where it's actually spawning in. So if you're on the wrong side of a Hellhound spawn, you can get blocked off by literally nothing. That's fun. Character face paints were added for both the Aether and Chaos characters. Okay. Player health was increased to 200 in normal and 250 in casual. Personally, as someone who's never been great at these games, I really appreciate that. Zombie Tigers were heavily nerfed and can no longer one-shot the player. The damage of their lunge attack was reduced from 150 to 100, if I recall correctly. And most surprisingly, new weapons were added to weapon kits. The previously blackout exclusive MP40 and Galil were given to all players. And the SWAT RFT, Daemon... Daemon? Demon? Daemon 3XB, Cap 45, Switchblade X9, and the Rampage Shotgun can all be fully customized if you unlock them from the contraband stream during their respective operations. If you didn't get them though, not to worry. Like World War II, the weapons will still appear in the mystery box if you didn't have the time to grind to the respective tier. This one was actually added as I was writing the script, but with the introduction of the Shamrock and Awe event, Jack Septicai was added to the box on 9, Voyage of Despair, and Dead of the Night. Simply shoot green-eyed zombies and follow the rainbow to the box. Top of the morning, you ladies! My name is Jack Septicai and welcome back to... Ah! Personally, I find many of these additions to be positive ones, as it can help the game feel less oppressive to newcomers. So, now that we're up to speed, let's finally dive into Dead of the Night. And, as always, let's start out with what I liked about the map. Starting with the most important part of any map, the layout. Like many maps in the Blundelverse, Dead of the Night is a relatively close quarters, fast-paced map with choke points that are conveniently, and thankfully, designed to be wide enough for two human-sized hitboxes to fit through at once. The map is split into four main areas. The mansion itself, which serves as the map's hub area, the graveyard, the forest, and Alistair's greenhouse. Each area is well designed with spawns placed just far enough to keep the action fast, but fair, and offers a slightly different style of play with different available assets. For example, the graveyard is relatively barren except for a perk machine, but it does provide the player with debatably the best looping area in the entire map. 
Compare this to the forest, which houses the Pack-a-Punch machine and two powerful wall weapons, but is much more difficult to survive in. Additionally, each area has a conveniently placed fast travel, so stamina up isn't as much of a necessity as it is in Blood of the Dead or Voyage of Despair. Let's talk special enemies. Returning from the previous Chaos maps are the four elemental catalyst types, but sadly my personal favorite creepy crawlies, the Blight Fathers, are nowhere to be found. Taking their place are three new special enemy types, the Werewolves, which serve as this map's mid-round heavy, the Nosferatus, more of a vermin type enemy than anything, and their edgy cousins, the Crimson Nosferatus. I really like these additions and feel like they add some intensity to the gameplay. Okay, well, to be more accurate, I like two of these additions. But we'll get more into these little buggers later. Werewolves are simple heavies that lack a ranged attack, so the occasionally unfair deaths of the Blightfather and the Stoker are nowhere to be found. But in exchange, they can leap at the player from a distance. Then there's Crimson Nosferatus. Unlike normal Nosferatus, Crimsons rarely appear and can't even begin spawning in normally until round 35, or until you awaken the one in the graveyard, whichever comes first. They act similarly to standard Nosferatus, but have an additional attack where they can leap at the player and bite into their neck, holding them in place for the duration of the attack. During this period, zombies can still swipe at the player and deal damage, but what prevents this from being woefully broken is that after the attack, the player is given a 4 second grace period where no enemy will target them. This is just enough time for health regeneration to begin, but not enough for it to go up significantly. Aside from their gameplay, their design and audio is surprisingly creepy. This is something I almost never expect from a Treyarch title, as they intentionally design their games to be more like action slash fantasy movies with spooky themes. All this adds up to an effectively frightening heavy enemy. When I see marauders, destroyers, werewolves, or normal Nosferatus, I don't really pay them all that much mind. But when I spot one of these little devils creeping around, I refocus my attention and try to take it down as quick as I can. Because I know if I don't, they can potentially ruin my entire match. Crimsons fall into this nice little middle ground where they're threatening, but not game-breaking. It's not often that a special enemy falls into this category, but when they do, they can really make a map's gameplay more engaging. One last interesting thing to note about the Crimsons is that when they're gearing up for a pounce, their eyes start glowing and they play a unique running animation similar to a hunter from Extinction. So if you see one trotting along like this, run. The amount of content in the map is quite impressive. There's the map's main quest, if you're into that kind of thing, silver bullets, the two upgrades for Alistair's Folly, the stake, the Savage Impaler, which actually serves as a fairly effective counter to Nosferatu's, and more. But the best addition is easily the silver bullets. For a small price, you can enhance the ammunition of all standard weapons, even the Helion Salvo. Yeah, that makes sense. When equipped, silver bullets will deal increased damage to werewolves, much like the full metal jacket attachment to killstreaks. But what makes this feature so amazing is that you can refill ammo for any silver bullet equipped weapon at any time, essentially giving the player unlimited ammo if they have the cash to spare. This was a feature I loved about World War II, as it let me pick my favorite weapon and run with that for as long as it was effective. So to see it return here put a really big smile on my face. But of course, we need to ask the question, does this completely break the game? Uh, kinda? But I'll be honest, I can't be asked to care. As I said long ago in my ExoZombies review, I'd much prefer a game to be incredibly easy than oppressively difficult. Does that make me a filthy casual? Yes. Yes it does. The map's lore. The story of Rhodes Manor holds a ton of backstory. Throughout history, the land has been home to druid cults, viking conquests, and has been linked to the deaths of those who have attempted to defile the land. Thomas Roth attempted to set fires to the oak trees next to the manor, then came home later that night speechless, and a couple days later, set fire to his home and burned inside along with it. The map also gives explanations to many of its enemies and quest steps such as the Wicker Man in the Graveyard, which was built by a man responsible for the creation of a druid cult in the 1780s. And the map's werewolves are linked to druid legends, where they would curse their most powerful enemies and transform them into massive beasts to safeguard the sacred oaks. Since we now know that Prima Matera has been around since before Christ, it brings up the question of, were the legends true in some powerful druid cult found out how to harness the power of Prima Matera? but history misinterpreted it as a religious curse. 
World War II zombies did a similar thing with misinterpreted legends actually tying back to the main story. For example, the Old Testament makes mentions of albino giants that walked the land and controlled armies of the dead. The book referred to them as the Nephilim, which they believed to be the offspring of a god and a human. But World War II's canon reveals that these Nephilim were actually Thulean warriors that controlled the dead through Geistcraft. Now, the Chaos story isn't as successful as World War II in this regard, but I still love how they both tie their stories into old legends. My favorite little element of the mansion's lore, though, is actually an original story with no ties to the real world, at least to my knowledge. The story of Nursemaid Catherine. During the Pack-a-Punch process, you'll come across one of four paintings around the map, which, when interacted with, will reveal previously scratched out parts of the image. After that, while escorting Catherine throughout the manor, she'll rattle off some trivia about whatever character initiated the escort process, as well as a cryptic part of her story and what ultimately led to her hanging. What I find neat about this mechanic is that you're not going to get the entire story in one game, since only one painting is revealed during the match. Let's say one match you find one that depicts Catherine's arrest. Sure, doesn't mean much on its own, but then in another match, you might get a quote from her that talks about how her husband was a vicious wife beater and how he quote unquote got what he deserved. Or maybe it was got what was coming to him. I don't know. The map doesn't out and out tell you everything about the mansion and the character and instead lets you put the pieces together yourself. Additionally, she appears as a guiding hand during the Savage Impaler side quest and the map's main trial after the Wicker Man sacrifice. So if the map's main quest there is something you enjoy, there's even more story to unravel. Oh, hello, my good woman. You are one of the help, yes? Well, what are you waiting for? Help me. Now let's get into the characters. Dead of the Night features an all-star cast, Helena Bonham Carter as Christina Fowler, a phony psychic that preys on people's belief in the supernatural to make a quick buck, Kiefer Sutherland as Gideon Jones, a stage show cowboy that, due to his abrasive personality, was fired for constantly drinking and fighting, Charles Dance as Alistair's bedeviled butler, Godfrey, and Brian Blessed as Jonathan Warwick, a long-retired general that's been looking for another fight to ignite that fire in his belly he felt during the war. Surprisingly, I like all of these characters. They're all distinct and, as I alluded to, have their own demons, but thankfully aren't nearly as deadly serious as Primus. In fact, they're all incredibly entertaining, especially the Brigadier. Look at the size of that thing! Whatever else happens tonight, that fucker's head gets mounted on my wall. The Brigadier is a treasure and must be protected at all costs. Ah! Uh oh, but if we're talking about who's the most interesting character, that's definitely Godfrey. On the surface, Godfrey appears to just be an Alfred-like character, proper, well-spoken, and loyal to his master. However, there's more to him than that. He seems to resent the fact that he ended up as a butler, as he claims that he originally wanted to join the army, but was denied, and now lives life as an underappreciated servant. So now that he's in the middle of a fight, there's several instances where he admits that he's dreamed of combat for years, and you get the feeling that he was already teetering on the edge long before Dark Godfrey came along. Now for as silly and DeviantArt-esque as the name is, I really like the dynamic between Godfrey and Dark Godfrey. Because it's established that Godfrey is a deeply unsatisfied individual with pent-up frustrations, it makes Dark Godfrey feel more like a manifestation of his mind's darkest thoughts than some magic voice in his head. By all that's holy, I will go through anything that bars my way. Yes, now you're getting it. Actually, let's get fanfic -y for a bit. Let's pretend that we hadn't played Voyage of Despair yet. We cut out every shot in the intro of Godfrey's third eye, and throughout the map, focus more on the idea that this might actually just be a manifestation of a frustrated man. Then in the outro, when Godfrey picks up the scimitar, we get our first look at Godfrey's third eye. <laughs> Yeah, that wasn't the best way to word that. We get to see that Godfrey is actually possessed by something, and it wasn't him just going crazy, and that there's something more powerful at work here. Then, with the help of the comics, Voyage of Despair, and the mystery music video, we could put the pieces together of what actually happened to Godfrey. Now, that's just my little fanfic, and I'm not trying to say it would be better like this or anything. I just like throwing out little fanfic-y ideas like that. 
but even though what's actually in the map lacks mystery, I still think it's fairly well done regardless. When Charles Dance was interviewed about his role in Dead of the Night, he said he was surprised by how good the writing was. Now, originally, I thought he was just being nice as I was still really grumpy about just how poorly written Aether is in this game, but he's kind of right. The characters are interesting, the lore is well fleshed out, there's a nice sense of mystery if you somehow haven't played the other Chaos maps, and the dialogue is a bit less handholdy than many of Jason and Craig's other projects. Before we move on to the negatives, let's quickly go over the little things that may not warrant their own segment, but I feel deserve mention nonetheless. I love this map's use of colors. Each area has slightly different color temperature. The mansion makes heavy use of bright oranges, the greenhouse mixes orange with teal, the graveyard is almost entirely blue, and the forest is a really dark teal with red highlights. The FX when you acquire the Sentinel artifact. I know it's essentially just the same effects from Voyage of Despair, but it still looks nice. Mystery is the best song in Black Ops 4 and you cannot change my mind. As much as I dislike Scarlet's character, it was nice to see her convey an emotion that wasn't smug, self-satisfied little shit for a couple seconds at least. The mix of Alistair's theme used in the final seconds of the map's outro is simply fantastic. Now we move on to the stuff that I'm not too big a fan of. And what better place to start than the very beginning and the execution of the early game party split up. I love this feature back in Verruckt. Back when I started playing that map with friends, it led to some really intense moments. So naturally, I was initially excited to see this return in Dead of the Night. Sadly though, this map doesn't even pretend to commit to it, and you can have your entire party reunited by round two without even trying. What's worse is that when one side purchases a door, it opens the other side's door as well, completely removing the need for team coordination. It's a gimmick that feels like it's only there to evoke nostalgia and nothing more. The upgrade quest for Alistair's Annihilator. Not since Zetsubo no Shima has there been an upgrade quest you have to jump through this many hoops for. Getting the base weapon is easy enough, but to get the fully upgraded weapon, you, no joke, need to collect 13 separate parts. 3 for Pack-a-Punch, 6 for Silver Bullets to get the Werewolf Chaos material, 2 for the Chaos Theory, and finally, another 3 for Alistair's Annihilator. Admittedly, the weapon itself is a lot of fun to use and is super unique, but the amount of time spent running around looting the place is just kind of annoying, even when you understand where everything actually is. However, there's one step that, ooh, is giving me a bit of a problem. The one where you need to get a hypnotized zombie to dig up a part in the forest. Because the effect is seemingly random when charged up, you'll have your zombie ready at the dig pile, and then you'll just launch a tornado at it instead of the acid blast. I've had matches where I've had to go through multiple rounds just to get the part. To add insult to injury, you're not even guaranteed to get the part from your first dig pile. This doesn't happen often, but when it does... Hoo boy! A silver lining is that, besides this step's annoying RNG, most of the part grabbing doesn't rely on RNG and can be done mid-round so you don't need to rely on someone else holding a zombie. So at least that's nice. The special enemy balance is occasionally overwhelming. This is a problem that plagues every single Chaos map if you play the map's vanilla. In this map, there's zombies, werewolves, Nosferatus, crimson Nosferatus, and four separate types of catalysts. One of which can make standard zombies much tankier and lets them deal more damage per swipe. The amount of special enemies can admittedly make moment-to-moment -moment gameplay far more intense than the Aether maps, but at the same time, they can overwhelm even good players very quickly and occasionally throw the map's balance for a loop. Luckily though, there's a very easy way to fix these balance issues. <laughs> yeah, boy. While we're talking about the special enemies, let's get into that one enemy type I hinted at my distaste for earlier, the Nosferatus. Many dislike these enemies due to their health regeneration delay on a successful hit. While that is a bit annoying and makes quick revive pretty much essential, 
The problem I have with them is that they don't really have a balancing factor. Many other special enemies in Call of Duty have some sort of trade-off to their power. Let's take a quick look at some examples. Whistlings in World War II. They could deal massive amounts of damage and had a ton of health, but they were very slow, had an obvious weak point that was incredibly vulnerable to gunfire, and, after some tuning, spawned in relatively low numbers. Hellhounds and Pests. Both of these types are incredibly fast, but as a trade-off, they deal less damage and have significantly lower health than normal. These are just a few examples of many, but with these in mind, let's take a look at the Nosferatus. They're fast, lower to the ground than most enemies, can leap at the player, have a surprisingly high spawn rate, increased health compared to standard zombies, and slow down the player's health regeneration while dealing standard damage on a successful hit. The icing on the cake here is that their attacks are actually an area of effect unlike standard zombies, which means that they don't even have to be facing you to deal damage to you, and can actually hit you if you're behind them. You may remember the Marauders in 9 had a similar issue. And yes, it was just as annoying there. The Pack-a-Punch setup. This is an area that Black Ops 4 was actually making great strides in improving. The method to unlock Pack-a-Punch is incredibly simple on all maps prior to Dead of the Night. Even Blood of the Dead, for its seemingly unending amount of problems, has a very simple method of unlocking Pack-a-Punch. Dead of the Night, however, is a bit of a step back. To unlock the forest area of the map, the player needs to charge up three separate seeing stones, and after gazing into them, seek out three random items to get tuning forks. Each item has an associated micro quest, which can range from escort a ghost to defend this area without leaving the circle. While all of these are kind of fun the first time, the novelty quickly wore off for me, and now whenever I boot up the map, it's one of those, all right, let's just get this out of the way kind of things. However, this may not be the case for every player, and I certainly see the appeal of maps that tie their PAP setups into the overall stories, like Mob of the Dead, Shadows of Evil, Raven the Redwoods, and... <sighs> One of the last map-centric things I want to talk about before I move on is the outro cutscene. Oh boy, I've been waiting to dive into this. For starters, the animations are stiff and unnatural, like their performance capture artists were super uncomfortable the entire time. This is something that's surprisingly prevalent in Black Ops 4. It's surprising because, whether you thought they were effective or not, Black Ops 3's IGCs were very well made, with the exception of a botched bone rotation here or there. But in Black Ops 4, they look really unfinished. Sounds aren't synced properly, effects pop in constantly, the lighting is much flatter, and the cinematography is all over the place. Take Scarlet's car chase, for example. What could have been a really cool action scene is ruined by cinematography that shifts from shaky cam to smooth dolly close-ups to... Dutch angles? Okay. Another example is when Dark Godfrey finally takes over and kills the other three. Remember that scene in Revenge of the Sith where Palpatine executes three Jedi Knights in under 10 seconds? Yeah, it's kinda like that. Everything every character does is comically slow. Which? Ragged. Pompous ass. Ah, bastard! It's like the fight choreographer was out to lunch, and they just decided, eh, we'll wing it in one take. Then we get our introduction to Scarlet. She shoots Godfrey through the chest, and then gets mad when he dies before giving her information. Like, what did you expect, idiot? You shot him in the chest! Maybe you should have shot him in the leg or something! And finally, this one isn't really anything that the map itself does wrong, but I do want to talk about this map's overall place in Black Ops 4 season. Now for as much flack as we give Craig and Jason, they understand the basics of storytelling and didn't originally plan to release this map as DLC. I had this whole conspiracy theory segment written out, but turns out they actually confirmed this during the Twitter Q&A Treyarch held for 115 day. Why did Dead of the Night come out after 9 instead of the other way around? Why flip the, why flip the chronology like that? Dead of the Night was always intended to have a celebrity cast, and so, due to kind of recording schedules and so forth, we had to put it later in the schedule. While I completely understand that things just don't go the way you want them to sometimes in creative endeavors, I really think Chaos would have benefited from their original release ideas, especially with how this map is written. For example, the way the outro is made. They treat Scarlet's reveal like some big deal, even though we've already seen her. And this line... Where is my father? What have you done to Alistair Rhodes? 
Its original purpose was to convey to the audience that this was the daughter character Godfrey had previously referred to. But since this map came out after Voyage in 9, it just comes across as awkward. This map is also intentionally very vague with what everything really is because, again, it was written as an on-disc experience. We don't actually see where the zombies even come from in the intro. We just see the black goo from Prometheus flying through the air after the cultist pulled an artifact out of a bag. Additionally, where do the box and perk altars come from? How does the sentinel artifact even work and what is its purpose? Most of these questions were later answered in Voyage of Despair and 9. In Voyage's intro, when the cultist activates the sentinel artifact, we get to see the origins of the zombies, the box, and the perks. Then 9 rolls around, and we got some of our questions answered about what the order is, the prima materia, and the trials. Basically, what I'm trying to say through all this rambling is that because of how everything was written and not adjusted in the slightest, we already had all the answers when Dead of the Night finally released. So the map's sense of mystery ultimately comes across as kind of pointless. All right, time for my personal favorite part of the video. The part where I get to discard any semblance of legitimate criticism and just point out stupid things that bugged me. The nitpicks. Let's get into it. The geometry on the stairs to the forest terrace are Z fighting. The map's intro dates the events as occurring on March 20th, 1912, but a newspaper on Voyage that reports on the fire at Rhodes Manor is dated March 10th, creating a very easy to catch continuity flub. Another continuity flub, but if Scarlet hasn't seen her father in 15 years, how did her ballistic shield get to Alistair's mansion? During the map's intro, you can see certain lights and shadows pop in on this shot. Pre-rendered, by the way. Speaking of the intro, it has the exact same problem Voyage of Despair did, where it frequently drops frames. 30, 60, 30, 60, 30, 60. Yeah, I know I recycled this for my last Black Ops 4 video, but what do you want? When the box skull says bye bye, the audio sync is off. I know this is a problem across all the Chaos maps, but I'm unsure if I'll end up covering them, so might as well seize the opportunity while it's available. Upon entering the forest, you can see the werewolf pop into place on the tree. This man has found out how to hold his welling with his mind. When Scarlet turns to face the Order's plane, the belt of her corset clips through her shirt. This wouldn't be an issue if I didn't already know that there's cinematic joints on that belt to prevent this very thing from happening. There. See? Simple fix. So, overall, Dead of the Night was a surprisingly fun little one-off map that I really did not expect to enjoy as much as I did. Of course, it has its fair share of issues, primary being that Nosferatu's are mildly unbalanced, and that the map occasionally gets bogged down in the ever-familiar, and ever-frustrating, scavenger hunts that have plagued Blundell's run on zombies for years. But if you can get past that, and the fact that this map could not have been released at a worse time, you're in for a really fun ride populated with unique, light-hearted characters. Oh, come on, who am I even trying to fool with this pseudo-professionalism? I love this map, and I cannot recommend it enough. Well, that's all for today. This is the only Black Ops 4 video I have planned at the moment, but if you would like to see more, please let me know. I'm always open to making videos on things I enjoy, which, yes, does rule out making a video on Blood of the Dead. It would probably be kind of cathartic to lay into that map, but I'll be honest. My desire to rant about Blood of the Dead is easily outweighed by my desire to just continue not playing Blood of the Dead. I wouldn't mind talking about the others though, as there's something that I can enjoy or appreciate about each of them, regardless of their faults. I feel the discussion on the other maps would be much more balanced, which is what I enjoy writing the most. So if that's something you'd like to see, please let me know. Anyway, thank you all for watching, and have a great day.